And it's my pleasure on behalf of CSIS and our partners at the uh, U.S. Naval Institute to welcome you to the latest of our maritime security dialogues. Um, before we begin our session today, just the quick reminder on safety. There are obviously the glass doors behind you, and we have two exits um, uh, behind me. And should a fire alarm or something go off, uh, we'll have staff here to direct you um, either out the back of the building or out the front of the building. Um, the Maritime Security Dialogue, as a reminder, really does, we think, bring a unique perspective by having two of the foremost nation's respected nonpartisan institutions, CSIS and USNI, bringing together um, an, a series that highlights challenges facing the Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard. And those challenges are from the national level, policy level, to Navy concept development and program design. We're very fortunate to have this series sponsored by Lockheed Martin and Huntington Ingalls Industries. And especially today, we're very pleased to be uh, bringing forward Rear Admiral Matt Winter, who is the Chief of Naval Research. Innovation, of course, is the major buzzword right now in Washington, and some people uh, get to just say it, and other people actually have to implement it and make it mean something. And Rear Admiral Winter is at the forefront of that challenge set. Uh, moderating our event today is my partner in crime, Vice Admiral Pete Daly, the CEO and, uh, of the U.S. Naval Institute. So please join me in a warm welcome to Rear Admiral Winter. Good morning, folks. Um, thank you, Dr. Hicks and uh, Admiral Daly, for this opportunity to have a dialogue. Um, I have some prepared remarks that are captured in PowerPoint, uh, but. Uh, I'm re really looking forward to the question and answer session uh, after these uh, about 15, 20 minutes of discussion. Some familiar faces out there, um, so give me the hard questions. Uh, the unfamiliar uh, faces give me the harder questions. So, um, uh, Chief of Naval Research, uh, Echelon 1 Command, uh, direct report to the Secretary of the Navy and the Chief of Naval Operations, Commandant of the Marine Corps, charged with the responsibility uh, for the science and technology mission uh, for the Department of the Navy. Uh, but before I get into that, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the word innovation. Um, it's probably the most used, well, let's say the second most used word right behind acquisition reform um, inside the Beltway. Uh, it's important to understand you can't go to aisle five of Walmart and pick up a can of innovation. And sometimes leadership, uh, you may even find yourself doing this, directing your team to be innovative. And then they walk away going, what's that mean? Does that mean work harder? What does that really mean? So I want to uh, give you a hypothesis on what I think that means in the context of our Secretary of the Navy's innovation uh, vision. And then I want to talk a little bit about the Office of Naval Research, since I'm the Chief of Naval Research, and talk about two elements, the business of science and the science of science. We get really focused on the science of science, and I'm going to show you some really eye-watering, innovative solution sets. But to do that, you got to make sure you got a foundation of effective and efficient business of science. That means, you know, when the cool science is happening, it hits the belt sander of contracting or funding types or no votes in policy. We have a, a responsibility to look at the business of science as much as the science of science. And then uh, I'll hypothesize at the end of what's the next big thing? I usually get that question. So what's the next big thing? So I'll lead turn that question and we'll have a conversation. Okay, slide please. Uh, Secretary Mavis, uh, uh, one of his uh, cornerstone of um, a strategy for his um, uh, tenure uh, was let's understand what innovation is. Uh, established Task Force of Innovation, uh, Office of Naval Research, a couple other folks part of that uh, uh, task force. Uh, we, we rallied around three elements, uh, people, information, and ideas, and five lines of effort. I'm not going to read those to you. What's important is how do you define and lead innovation? I look at this as Understanding an open and providing an open, inclusive, and collaborative environment that brings the best and brightest people to generate a solution space, right, based upon credible data and information that then emanates and germinates and generates innovative ideas. If you talk about that and you see how that DNA thread gets to the innovative ideas versus saying, I need an innovative idea. You can actually uh, get your workforce, your team, and, and your senior leadership uh, to better articulate 
what innovation uh, allows us to really uh, accomplish. So with that, we've been given the opportunity from scientific and technical to tactical and operational across the Navy and the fleets and forces, uh, in our uh, laboratories and warfare centers, uh, in our partnerships with industry and academia uh, to, um, uh, to bring the best and brightest together to work on our hardest problems. And what I'm going to show you now are uh, how we do that, that business of science quickly, uh, and then uh, some of the science of science. Okay, next slide. So the Office of Naval Research. Um, next slide. Office of Naval Research. Uh, the provider of science and technology to the, uh, to the Navy and the Marine Corps, uh, about 4,000 strong uh, scientists, technicians, and support personnel in 23 locations around the world. And I'll talk a little bit about our global presence. Uh, $2 billion sounds like a lot of money, and it is. And we have a responsibility to efficiently and effectively use the taxpayer and the stewardship of those resources. But when you think of it as a $160 billion corporate 100 uh, company. It's about 1.2 percent. How many companies invest about 1 percent to remain relevant and dominant and maintain that market uh, competition in the future? Not very many survive with that kind of investment. So I'm going to talk to you about how the business of science allows us to actually realize a 5 to 6 X of that $2 billion. Uh, the people and the partnerships partners over thousands we have over 2,500 small, medium, and large industry partners, and about 1,100 to 1,500 at universities and colleges uh, in the U.S. and around the world um, working with us to do what you see in the lower left, which is our strategic plan. And I have trifolds for handouts. Um, this is not just a glossy document that we throw on the, uh, wait for somebody to pick it up and, and read it. We roll it up. And we use it every morning uh, to make sure that that inclusive, dynamic solution space keeps being generated uh, and we don't throw anything off the table. Uh, and, and that mission uh, for the science and technologists in the Office of Naval Research is to discover and invent that new knowledge, knowledge that's never been known before yesterday, uh, that, that begets technologies that are breakthrough, that allows us to then experiment and demonstrate uh, with the capabilities that give our Marines and our sailors the technological advantage. In complementary, gives our laboratories, our scientists in industry, academia, and in the government the technological advantage um, in those hollowed halls uh, and the laboratories. Next slide. So we have an investment strategy. We don't do cool science because it's cool. We do science to enable our warfighting capabilities. At the end of the day, we are the enabling venture capitalists new idea generator, technological leap organization. That's our, that's our mission. We do a lot of investments in the basic research domain. That's our red box you see there to the right. In that, those are the petri dishes and the test tubes, the flubber and flux capacitors of the future that our scientists working with industry and academia are scanning across an incredible breadth of technologies uh, and uh, scientific disciplines to generate that new knowledge that then the, the other three boxes that you see there allow us to knit together advanced materials, hmm, electromagnetic pulses, a, uh, a hardened projectile. Admiral, do you think a project where I can accelerate a piece of metal from zero to Mach 5 and 100 feet would have any kind of applicability? That's the kind of conversations we have. Um, and then we bring those forward in that gray box. That's technology push. No warfighters ask for a laser can or a rail gun or LDU UV. Now they are. Now that's technology pull. We have to continue to get that solution space and push, push these ideas. And it doesn't just happen. It comes with the people. It comes with my junior sailors. It comes with my junior officers. It comes with our industry and academia coming together. There is no market on good ideas. I tell my ONR folks, all my teammates, you're not the best, but you're the best and brightest in what you know and what you're doing. And we've got to continue to search for the better and the more brighter in the four corners of the globe. Uh, with that, um, you can see along the x-axis, uh, it's important to understand this business as a science. We have equities in the Office of Naval Research for the current fleet. 
the sailors that are haze gray and underway and our Marines that are boots on the ground. And that's that blue box. I have an enormous amount of uh, opportunities that we get from junior sailors and junior um, uh, officers uh, and Marines that give us great ideas that then we go put some dollars behind uh, to turn their great ideas into reality. Uh, along that, uh, in the center there, you see uh, uh, the fleet and force under development. That might be what you call that lethargic 5,000 acquisition process. My previous responsibilities were leading in, those, in that domain. It's not lethargic. Some things need to take 10 and 15 years to develop and deliver. But if it doesn't, it shouldn't. And so what the science and technology equities there are to bring uh, technological solutions that help programs of record, technical baselines, delivered and fielded capabilities to remain effective, capable, efficient, reliable, and cost, uh, reduce costs. And then finally, the one that everybody really believes is that uh, it's a future, future force, excuse me. Um, and those are where we're looking at um, into that future uh, and we'll talk about some of that, um, uh, some of that technology. All comes together uh, and we div divvy up the dollars. How does the, um, the efficiency of that allocation occur? Um, our forefathers had the insight to give to the Chief of Naval Research, not Matt Winter, but Chief of Naval Research, um, a collection of authorities that minimizes getting to yes and, and, and is, minimizes the time getting money to the performers and allows decisions to be made measured in minutes and hours versus weeks and months. I'm my own resource sponsor, I'm my own head of contracting authority, I'm my own um, Echelon 1 commander uh, within the 6-1 uh, the to 6-3 domain, and we can see things emanating out of that basic research and immediately put an experimentation demonstration together, and you don't have to go find a yes. Right? That doesn't mean I can run open loop without any accountabilities. Uh, and we have that uh, check and balance with our uh, appropriate um, uh, Navy and Marine Corps leadership. But it's important to understand how we go faster, because we're always told to go faster. Two first order effects is getting to the person that can say yes and getting the resources to the person that can do the work. Right? That's usually the two things that are the timelines. Uh, I call it the time tax to get and moving. Okay, next slide. So who are those performers? Um, I get a lot of discussion about uh, we, we don't incentivize or we don't utilize the industrial base in the S&T community much. Uh, that's the furthest thing from the truth. Um, we look at where the best and brightest resides. Um, there's been a trend over, um, over the, you know, the last 70 years, and we're celebrating our 70th anniversary in the Office of Naval Research this year. Uh, the industry uh, migrating out of basic research. Uh, there's still uh, a, a modest footprint in the industry in basic research. But predominantly, that's your academics, universities, and government laboratories. And you can see that our triangle performers um, of government, industry, and academia brings together a continuous thatching and, um, and uh, uh, rolling in and out of those performers. Uh, but over time, our percentages on the right-hand side there show the pies of basic research red box, uh, applied research middle two boxes, and advanced research um, our, our blue box, for lack of a better way to uh, identify that. And industry, academia, and our, our Navy laboratories and warfare centers. And you can see that migration from uh, academia to industry. Uh, we are uh, absolutely beholden and need industry and academia performers. Uh, it's absolutely essential to bring together that triad, but we need to bring, bring together a triad uh, of those performers that we understand and what they can do. Um, and I'll show you how we um, continuously bring in about 20% annually of non-traditional um, performers. That, to me, a non-traditional performer is a performer that has not done work with me before, me as an O&R. And we'll go forward with that. Next slide. So it's not just in the United States. We're in 60 countries around the world. Uh, we have an O&R Global Echelon 2 Command headquarters in London uh, with office locations in consulates and um, and U.S. embassies, so not brick and mortar of O&R um, logos, uh, in Prague, uh, Tokyo, Singapore, Santiago, and Sao Paulo. And those scientists' job and mission is to go in country and surrounding countries and be the s and diplomacy uh, arm uh, for the United States Navy. Uh, and they do a great job. Uh, we, we exchange basic research predominantly and looking for technological commonality. Uh, but also to uh, try to minimize technological surprise on the global stage. 
Uh, next slide. Next slide. Uh, no bucks, no buck Rogers, blue line, RDT and E budget, Department of the Navy. Uh, 15 to 17 billion dollars annually. Two billion goes to the S and T. That's your red line. Um, the uh, across our sister services, we are all about a two billion dollar investment. What's the, what's the takeaway? The takeaway is, is that we are combined in our commonality across our services to not duplicate. Uh, and that's something that's uh, been very effective uh, at the OSD level with our um, Assistant Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, uh, Mr. Welby, uh, and our um, uh, communities of interest to minimize the duplication, maximize the leveraging, so they can get, once again, start building that $2 billion getting the ROI up into the five and six X. Uh, very important. But it's back to my venture capitalist analogy. Uh, we really need to be looking at, and I've championed uh, appropriate uh, top line increases, but everybody comes asking for top line increases. Um, it's important to go on record that uh, we have shovel ready scientific projects um, that could easily expand those boxes uh, and bring uh, additional solution space for our warfighter. Next slide. Okay, so that's sort of the business of the science. So what are we doing? Um, we have an incredible uh, depth and breadth of projects. In those four boxes you saw, about 7,000, 7 to 8,000 uh, projects in the uh, red box uh, in uh, industry, academia, and uh, government labs. The other box is between three and 400. Okay, so somewhere in the neighborhood of about 11,000 projects ongoing at any one time. Across that performer network, um, measured roughly in about uh, 20 to 30,000 human beings uh, doing uh, basic applied and advanced research. Uh, what's important is, is that we have a mechanism to track that and to measure that. Uh, one of the things that was uh, uh, interesting taking in this, uh, in this position, we measured a lot of things, but we didn't really have any metrics. Uh, so understanding what's good and what's not good. For example, we transitioned 222 technologies out of S&T to our warfighter and to programs of record in FY15. 222. Is that 200 too many, 200 too less, right? It's a good number. It also starts to uh, chip away at this myth called the valley of death, right? Nothing ever transitions out of S&T. Well, if that's true, we'd be rowing in wooden boats and wearing life preservers, right? Something transitions. We've gone from sail to steam to nuclear propulsion. We've gone from flint to high, you know, to gunpowder to laser cannons. Uh, things transition. The question is, how do we articulate that? And how do we ensure that we're transitioning the most relevant technologies uh, to meet our warfighter capability gaps and, uh, and the mission sets that they need to execute. Uh, so this is a, a quick pictorial of how at the Office of Naval Research we do intersections across traditional geographical domains, warfighting domains, um, cyber. We can, we can slice and dice all of our projects in any way so that we can have information that's relevant to make good decisions. Because at the end of the day, I want to make a good decision that's long lasting. Um, in this case, you can see the colors aligned to those four boxes, red, uh, gray, gold, and blue, uh, to give you an appreciation. Next slide. Um, basic research. Usually I get a question of, is basic research dead? Do we really need to do basic research, right? Um, my tagline is, if you don't do it in the test tube, you're never going to get a launch tube. Um, and the fact of the matter is, is that almost everything that you touch, wear, eat, sleep, what have you, was generated or had its initial beginnings in some basic research thought. Um, we have um, roughly 800 new ideas provided monthly um, through our uh, online portal, which I'll show you where, where you can get that. Um, and most of those are in the basic research um, thoughts, some applied. Um, in this, you know, as we continue to focus on advanced materials in our laboratories um, and understanding how we can do microbial um, uh, energy, uh, it's, it's eye-watering where we, we're taking the positive electrons that are emitted by uh, the microbes in the seabed and we're capturing those uh, and we're hooking up some, uh, uh, you know, our red and black uh, uh, connectors and we're gathering the electricity, right? So if you think about that, we're not there yet, right? But that's basic research and understanding 
at, at the very bare bones. Um, being able to 3D print an artery, a vein, and a capillary, um, uh, which was recently done and understood how we can hold it up to the blood pressure of, uh, uh, of a human being. Um, understanding uh, new combinations and permutations of the uh, periodic table, it goes on and on and on. Um, that's what's occurring. And it's not just at the Navy Research Lab or the China Lake Warfare Center. This, these are in our um, thousands of academic institutions that we um, award three to 4,000 uh, grants annually. It's important to keep that volume focused in those areas to continue to generate solution space so that the ideas that then can be knitted together for capabilities can emerge. Absolutely essential. Next slide. From that basic research, this is some of the interesting um, where we talk about forging the future today. And these are, in my optic, I call it boundary layer. When people look at O&R, they say they're 100% innovative um, and they're transformational. And I'm okay with that. But when you get inside the O&R bubble, right, I've got some core stuff. It's core transformational, but there's core stuff. And what you're seeing here is a quick uh, uh, collage of things like the laser cannon, the rail gun, uh, things like our low cost swarming technology demonstrations, uh, where we're able to bring UAVs in flocks of 30 and then have four break off and go do something and come back if you've ever seen the starling birds fly like this. Um, the UAV, which is just a USB stick, that's not the science. The science is um, the intelligent algorithms um, and the ability to communicate, sense, and avoid, uh, uh, regroup, and, um, and separate. And that is domain agnostic. What I mean by that is we take that learning and we bring it into the surface. We're going to be doing a surface swarming uh, demonstration in September. We're doing our next uh, uh, airborne sur uh, swarming uh, next week, actually. Uh, and then we'll start to look at our swarming for UUVs. It's important to understand that to get that ROI, right, we can't say that that's a technology just for a particular application. It's for an application, but we have to continue to look how we can uh, go across all domains. Some of the neat uh, electromagnetic spectrum work we're doing with the computing power uh, and the, uh, the speed to be able to do multiple combinations and permutations, that has become a first order uh, enabler for us to truly dissect the electromagnetic spectrum. And then understand how a human being emits, how a piece of metal emits, how everybody emits, and then be able to bring that together so we can understand our emission profile. And that emission profile can then be dynamically uh, engaged and manipulated to look like something else, right? So you could have this piece of paper look like a MiG-29. Um, and and I'm, I'm not exaggerating for effect, right? Sometimes people say, that can't happen. I go, right, that's why we're working on it, right? The Office of Naval Research shouldn't be doing hard engineering and integration. Engineers should be doing hard engineering and integration. Scientists need to be doing, I can't do that, there's no way it's insurmountable, it'll never be done. Those are the problems we need to be working on. And then the manifestation of those are things that then become sort of, well, oh, that's, that's, that's obvious. And I go, it might be obvious to you today, but that generating that solution space to have an unmanned surface vehicle uh, working with Lidos uh, and being able to put, take that, uh, we're out in San Diego right now, be able to put different um, sensors on that and then provide a blended manned and unmanned capability to our fleet commanders. Um, being able to take those UUVs and um, have that endless supply of energy. Um, one of our projects is, is to build the Eisenhower Highway Network on the seabeds in the seven oceans, right? Because once we start have li large scale deployments of UUVs, right, we want them to go out for decades at a time and, and have man on the loop, but out there doing their own thing. So why can't they come in and they gas up or charge up, uh, communicate, hang out for maybe you know, a year or so, and then come back. I mean, those are the types of things that the blended, again, our junior officers with our warfare development centers working together uh, to bring together the operational context with the technological uh, solution space that helps the technologists tweak things here and gives um, the, uh, the warfighter the opportunity to uh, further expand their operational plans and their con ops. 
It's absolutely essential, and we do that on a regular basis. In that global uh, picture I showed you, our science advisors, we have 24 science advisors around the world in those fleet commands being that liaison and that communication element. Um, so uh, I'd be glad to take questions uh, at the end here on um, other um, projects that were ongoing, but I'm not gonna go through the, the 10,000 projects, uh, but there are things that I usually get the rail gun, I usually get the laser cannon, um, there are, those are good marquee, but, and it's the basic research that enabled that, but there are so many other um, activities that are going on, and I'll talk about what's the next big thing. Uh, next slide. So, um, third offset strategy um, from the De Deputy Secretary of Defense. He brought in all the science and technology chiefs as well as uh, his strategists uh, to provide um, some critical thinking uh, last year uh, to help um, shape um, the third offset strategy. F initially focused on machine to machine and intelligent systems and autonomy. Um, it also is, continues to move forward in things like um, uh, railgun and laser cannons and other capabilities that as I talk about it, you, wanna, you, wanna, um, you want to take your linear curve uh, and go exponential in technology capability um, over time. And right now there's a perception that we're on a um, we're on a linear scale. Um, and depending on where your optic is, I could understand that. But what I see, um, I see an exponential curve of technology maturation that's getting knitted together. And these are some of the examples, again, mapped to my four, our four box evaluation, or excuse me, uh, allocation strategy that aligns to uh, Secretary Works uh, and Secretary Carter's uh, third offset strategy. What really we want to talk about an offset strategy is how are we not just getting an evolutionary incremental technological step, but what truly are those disruptive uh, revolutionary technological steps? And I'm here to tell you what you see in the boxes are the things that are going to give the, the Department of the Navy and, all, and by extension the Department of Defense um, that technological um, advantage. Next slide. Um, so uh, those that have read The Innovator's Dilemma, I love that book. I go back and read it on a regular basis. Um, the, um, and you know when people really say that, do you really start at page one and go all the way there? I don't. I jump around. So anyway, um, I do like to read. Um, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the idea of maintaining that market share. And sometimes I get accused of making uh, O&R more business focused than it should be. Um, I'm not here to make this a business, but I'm here to say that if we don't look at that and, and, and use some of the innovative models uh, that corporate America uses, um, then, then we're not using every tool in our toolbox. Granted, our p and is zero, right? We're, not, we're a not-for-profit organization, but our return on investment is quality of life for 310 million Americans deepened and strengthened partnerships with our international partners, with industry, academia, strong industrial base, growing the next generation of technological leaders focused on uh, STEM and other initiatives, uh, and then national security, being able to ensure that quality of life is there. Right? So what are those investments that we should do? Should just let everybody do whatever they want in their laboratories and see what happens? No. So. What we've done is we've taken uh, the four box and put into four stamp um, like Christensen and said, how do we move from the evolutionary you know, standard um, established technologies and get up into that upper right hand box um, to the disruptive? And quite honestly, ladies and gentlemen, the Office of Naval Research, about 85% of our 11,000 projects are in that upper right box. That's our assessment, internal assessment, and it needs to continue to be there. That's, that's the domain where you, when, you, when you have the discovery and invention that allows you to give your warfighter that incremental and then to the substantial um, step function, that's what we need to be doing. And so what you see here is, again, that um, linear and exponential curve. In my blue arrow, this is Admiral Winters, Chief of Naval Research, these are the next big things, right? Um, my, uh, my ethics counselor is very good. Uh, you can't, I don't go and invest in anything, right? Can't, 
don't want to. Um, I invest in our workforce, in industry, academia, and in the government. Photonics, quantum research, you know, you know, we've been doing quantum for a long time. It's not new, right? If you don't understand the quantum principles, it's pretty simple. It really is. You don't have to be a physicist. Um, although my father was a theoretical physicist, so that helped me. And my mother was an English major, right? So growing up at the table, I always got it wrong and said it wrong, right? So you're sitting there going, all right, Dad, you know, I'm doing theorems in my mashed potatoes while I'm using, don't use ain't um, kind of thing. I, I, I challenge you to learn because 310 million Americans and our international partners, your thirst and, and inquisitiveness is what's going to keep moving ourselves forward. This next big thing in photonics and being able to truly move information, not just at the speed of light, but in ways we've, we can't even imagine, right? And that information being able to go to machine to machine to machine to man is a concept that's already been proven. So if you think about how computing power has been an enabler over the last 30 years, photonics, quantum, and our ability to do um, uh, machines at the nano level are gonna be an incredible game changer. Uh, we're gonna be able to genetically um, engineer um, microorganisms uh, that can sense it where you are uh, sense things in the in the battle space and when you can do that in hydro aero and vacuum domains um, that is something that then allows our our not only warfighter but transition to corporate and commercial applications um, to give the United States of America that technological edge those are some of the things that we're working on that will be where that blue arrow is predominantly the red box right now um, what I do is I look back in 30 years ago, what was in the red box, right? There wasn't any red box, but what were we doing? Uh, and so what should we be doing today so that 30 years from now, somebody's standing here saying that's, that, that was a, a relevant investment because there's really no wrong investment, relevant investment. Um, I have the, the best job in the world, but I've always had that no matter what job I'm in. Positive attitude, engaged leadership, um, decision-making, and... Um, uh, prudent judgment uh, is a, a skill set that I encourage you all to continue to master in your own lives. Because uh, I bleed red, white, and blue. I love this country, and I love our international partners and how we work together. Um, but the Office of Naval Research is not just doing science. We're, we are truly developing, supporting, and generating the next generation of leaders um, across this country. Um, and uh, I'm proud to be part of that. I'm proud to be the steward of this position, uh, and I'm, I'm glad to be the mad scientist of the uh, Navy and the Marine Corps. Uh, next slide. And with that, um, be ready to do questions. If you want to do uh, work with us and you're not familiar with how to do that, here's our website. You can go into the technical locator there. Um, we get about 800, like I said, white papers. We'd like your white papers. Um, we value your intellectual property. We don't sell it. I'm the Department of the Navy's trademark licensing and copyright um, executive agent. So we work with you on your intellectual property. Um, and then if you're interested in what we're actually soliciting in those four boxes and asking for proposals back, that's in, underneath the contracts and grants, um, be more than happy to uh, take questions on that. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen. Admiral. Well, good morning again, and uh, thank you, Admiral, for coming out today. It's a very complex responsibility that you have indeed, and tough to translate it in such a short time. I think you did well to do that. Um, just a couple of icebreaker questions before we open it up to the audience uh, this morning. Um, first question is, you've got eight other agents that are involved here and you have already alluded to it that this uh, innovation thing is everywhere. It's like it's the bomb. But uh, you've got the Strategic Capabilities Office with uh, Dr. Roper's efforts and DOD, which may be more resource than any innovation. And you've got uh, SecDef's Defense Innovation Units that mm. he's set up at uh, Silicon Valley and uh, now in Boston. Uh, could you just talk briefly about 
how you relate to those entities a little bit. Certainly. Um, uh, I'd start out with, uh, we got rid of our Director of Innovation at the Office of Naval Research. Um, and uh, we established the Director of Technology and the Director of Research. Um, there was a humanistic factor in thinking that you had to go to the Director of Innovation to be innovative um, or to submit an innovative idea. And so back to my thought about how you generate that solution space. The best and brightest are important. Uh, Strategic C Capabilities Office and Dr. Oprah and I have a very good relationship um, and we look at where our intersections lie uh, and understanding um, uh, the opportunities for his mission success and our mission success. Uh, his focus is department-wide, not just Naval and Marine Corps applications. Um, uh, his resources can be, are, are substantial uh, and an opportunity for us to partner uh, to pr uh, pursue uh, our Navy missions uh, within those four boxes that I talked about. But his predominant focus is on, on demonstration and prototyping. Uh, and as we come out of S&T into our demonstration and prototyping, uh, the Department of Navy has established, uh, and it's on the Hill right now working with Congress, our rapid prototype and experimentation and demonstration um, uh, program uh, to do similar efforts, not duplicative, um, as a strategic capabilities office. So we're looking to continue to partner with uh, Dr. Roper um, for our naval uh, missions. From a DIUX, um, uh, Secretary Carter um, sort of did a reset and went to uh, DIUX 2.0. Um, we sat down, I sat down personally with uh, Raj Shah, who's the director, uh, and gave an overview of the Office of Naval Research. Uh, we call it Awareness Days. Um, what keeps me up at night? Inefficiency. Um, inefficiency keeps me up at night because uh, somebody's doing something that's already been done before and it's on the shelf and just didn't know it was on the shelf, so you duplicate that effort, right? How do you inventory your shelf, shelf? How do you understand what's on the shelf? And that's not just projects. It's the way of doing business. It's resources. It's intellectual capital and so forth. So I had a conversation with, uh, with uh, Raj and said, uh, we want to partner with you. We want to be a provider, a performer uh, for DIUX. But we also want to be selfish and ask you to be a performer for us. Because DIUX and their inroads and relationships to truly non-traditional performers um, in areas that we would not even understand um, how to, to start a relationship provides another aspect of performer base that can help solve our hardest problems. And I was very encouraged hearing the DIUX team talk about how their commitment to public service and their desire to help solve our hardest problems. So um, solving those hardest problems needs to start with what are those problems and then what are the, who are the performers to do this. DIUX understands to bring performers, they, they will bring those folks that will be part of a team. And that team will be made up of the DIUX performers, uh, but also, bless you, the um, other uh, government, industry, and academia performers that are already working on other problems. So it was a very uh, productive and very uh, fruitful uh, meeting with DIUX, and we look forward to continuing to work with them. Great. Um, just to shift gears a minute, you know, one of the... Uh, of course, at the Naval Institute, we deal a lot with younger officers, and one of the things you get as a feedback is that often our perspective gets, uh, gets muted a little bit because there's a bureaucracy, there's a process, there's a hierarchical chain of command, and uh, you know, there's this feeling that for the, young, for the young folks, how do we get our thoughts and imaginative uh, ideas into the mix? And, and get them to the right folks without it being, you know, right. changed, so changed too much. But so, but just to finish, the, how do you, how do you, you've got these scientists, and I've always had this picture of O&Rs, you know, a group of scientists. You mentioned the warfare centers. How do we tap into that young imagination? Great, uh, great question. Um, I'll go back to an earlier comment. We do not have the corner market on great ideas uh, and the best and brightest. I, I arguably, I say we're the best and brightest, but we have to have that mindset, right? Right. Um, uh, the, the mechanisms to en encourage, uh, let's say, uh, um, accessions and retainment of new ideas and, and new intellectual capital. Uh, within the uh, warfare centers, there are 15 warfare centers and system centers in the Department of, this, uh, of the Navy. You may be familiar with places like Dahlgren and Pax River, Carter Rock, 
um, uh, Newport, and so forth. Um, in those warfare centers and system centers reside engineers, scientists, logisticians, testers, contracting officers, legal, finance. They are the acquisition workforce that ensures that we execute our science and technology and our program of records to deliver the capabilities to our sailors and marines. The, it's about a 10% workforce flow. And I bring that up because that's part of how we get new blood into them. Now, back in the heydays of the late 80s, we were measured in tens of thousands of uniform wearing engineers and scientists. We're down in the ones that to, to, to three to 4,000. The majority of that 4,000 scientists that I have in the Office of Naval Research, only 400, 10%-ish, um, are wearing a uniform. And half of those are reservists. My reservists are the smartest reservists you'll ever run into. 70% of them have doctorates, PhDs. A lot of them are the chief technology officer for, some, uh, for a corporate, uh, Fortune 500 company, and they're still serving in the uh, reserves. So we bring in new blood and new ideas through the reserve component uh, opportunities there. Our, our, our young uh, junior officers uh, have a lot of things they got to get done and checks in the box to be competitive for command at sea, which is what we want them to do. So we used to have time in their career to be able to do what we would call a, a um, a well-rounding tour, be able to go to a Pax River for a year, two years, go to Carter Rock, get an appreciation and understanding of how that domain works. And likewise, we, we benefit from their operational and their, and their new ideas. We're trying to reinvigorate that um, to get that flow through. So there's the next um, uh, element. Uh, there are, um, in the Office of Naval Research, uh, we have our Technology Solutions Initiative, uh, which is a waterfront, boots on the ground initiative uh, led by an E-9, my command master chief, um, and, a, and a group of civilians um, and a couple of uniformed uh, officers in the Office of Naval Research um, with a pull and push of new ideas on the waterfront for our sailors, marines, and junior officers. Um, we get about 25 new ideas a month. That's not enough, but it's 25 more than zero. Right. Um, and the awareness that that venue is, uh, exists for our junior officers and our sailors to be able to bring their good ideas. But this isn't just o and I mean, this is our fleet commanders, these are our squadron commanders, these are our division officers, our branch O's. They, there needs to be that culture of, tell me your new idea. Don't squash it. Um, and so, uh, CNO Richardson has been phenomenal in establishing an, uh, that culture of inclusion and new ideas. Um, and has really provided in all of his engagements uh, behind uh, cer certain closed door and in his all hands, uh, a challenge to all of our sailors um, and our junior officers to keep those new ideas coming and bring those new ideas directly to him or to, uh, I, see, um, I, I see a couple folks here uh, from a, um, uh, to his staff. Um, also opportunities for uh, direct engagement with um, other uh, parts of our Navy. So um, we're not done and we're not throwing confetti and declaring success, uh, but we want to continue to encourage that junior officer and, and young sailor uh, innovative idea uh, mechanism. Good. Glad to hear you have a right. shingle out for that. And that's going right. to open it up now to, uh, to the audience. Yes, sir, right in front here. John Admiral, you said some, some really uh, constructive things, I think, today about the role of industry and your partnership with industry and so forth. A lot of the decisions that are made to support the kind of S&T investment you're talking about in industry are made at the very highest level, at the CEO level, uh, and even with boards of directors. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about your, your sense of how the highest levels of industry are, are understanding your vision, how the communication is at that level, and so forth. Sure. Um, so from a science and technology perspective, um, uh, I've established, well, over my career from my other commands, I've established relationships in my, what I call my own communication pinwheel. And in that, for, let's use industry for, to your question, um, it's important that you, you know your counterpart to have that dialogue. Um, I've had um, 19 months-ish in this position uh, as the Chief of Naval Research, uh, and I've engaged across the board, small, medium, and large, of industry partners, predominantly at the advanced development 
um, science and technology, chief technology officer level of those companies, uh, which is the right domain to have. Um, and so that conversation, and they don't, I, I, I give the hard copy brief, but then if it's a certain company, I do, we do our research and we look at the intersections, and then we ask for, share with us what you're working on, we'll share with what we're working on to see where we can partner. Because politenesses and shaking hands and knowing each other is nice, but I want actions. And if you can't get an action out of that, um, and I don't mean about money, I'm talking about sharing knowledge uh, to solve those tough problems, then it's really a wasted, uh, a wasted engagement. So that's what we do, Office of Naval Research, and I'll say for Admiral Winter specifically. Well aware of similar engagements with, at, all the way up to CNO, Commandant, uh, Mr. Stackley, our senior, uh, our service acquisition executive, having industry counterpart engagements um, to talk about opportunities, to talk about what you're working on, uh, performers, uh, and how we can partner to solve our problems. Uh, one of uh, CNO uh, Richardson's um, design elements, which is really our department, of Na our Navy's design element, is on uh, partnerships uh, and it's strengthening and deepening our partnerships um, with our international partners but also with academia, with the industry, uh, to ensure we're bringing the best and brightest to solve our problems. Thanks. You mentioned earlier, just to follow up on that question, you mentioned earlier about how that the basic science and technology investment is key to the health of any organization. And obviously, for industry, there's a lot at stake. There's billions of dollars at stake for them in profit. Do you find that the sharing environment is correct? I mean. Do the proprietary, the proprietary shields go up, yeah. or is the sharing environment correct to get what you just described done, done? Yeah. So um, there are a number of uh, government uh, leaders I see out here, uh, and everybody's going to have their own perspective and their own experiences. Sure. Um, we are different across our services. Um, we're different even within our own services um, in the way we implement uh, and realize uh, the environment you just uh, articulated, Pete. Um, I'll use my personal experiences. Um, we cannot, as a, uh, as a government official, um, mandate um, the wholesale intellectual property exposure um, of our industry partners. Um, th but that doesn't mean th the other end of the spectrum where everything is uh, wrapped in proprietariness and we pay for um, things over and over and over again. So there's a blend there, and it really is case by case. Um, uh, Mr. Kendall's um, engagement on understanding the governance for IRAD, for example, um, I'm a proponent to push down to the acquisition leadership at the PEO and the PM level and hold them accountable for their engagement with their OEMs, their industry partners, for whatever their portfolio, to have an IRAD strategy. Um, that initiative in and of itself would go a long way. Then you can turn around and bring that to senior leadership. That way, you know, we're really good at giving industry direction. It's, it's not always clear and consistent, right? It changes when, when, uh, when the next PEO comes in. And, and that, how can you put a five and 10 year business plan together uh, when you say, yeah, invest in flubber. Okay, next time I'm talking, no, no, flux capacitors, right? And, and you've already brick and mortar and all that, right? So um, in the S&T world, we're a little, we have a little more maneuver room because if you take that S&T strategy, ladies and gentlemen, and you look at the nine S&T focus areas that devolve down into the hundreds of research projects and you work on those, you are pulling on the same rope as the Department of Navy S&T. And you will, you will be a partner with the Department of the Navy S&T uh, effort. Uh, and there's no fuzz on that. Thanks. Okay. Uh, this gentleman right here. Hi, Admiral Mark Pomerlo with C4ISRNet. Um, given the uh, increasing proficiency of uh, adversaries in the electromagnetic spectrum, I was wondering if you could describe uh, ONR's efforts in electronic attack for naval forces across the uh, warfare domains. Great, uh, great question. So, uh, well, it all starts with uh, what is the capability gap? Uh, what, what is our current as is and where do we need to go in the future? And that starts with our, our fleet commanders. Um, and uh, starts with our, uh, our warfare analysis branch within the uh, CNO's uh, OPNAV staff. Um, and so uh, we look at the, we call it the OPNAV N81, 
uh, and they do assessments across all uh, spectrum of mission areas. Uh, Electromagnetic spectrum, cyber domain, uh, those are sort of enabling capabilities uh, that cut across all the warfare domains. So as we look at what investments the science and technologists should be investing in discovering new phenomenology, then to look at technologies that should be matured, uh, we are drawing a uh, mapping to current programs of record as well as the capability gaps that do not have a material solution being um, aligned to that. And in that case, right now, uh, Office of Naval Research, one of our priorities is the electromagnetic maneuver warfare uh, investments. Um, on that collage, um, six of our innovative naval prototypes are dedicated to electromagnetic maneuver warfare. Um, they, they go classified immediately, and they should. One of the things I say to my international partners when we have our dialogue to share is, you have a crown jewel wrapper, I've got a crown jewel wrapper, right? Let's just put it on the table. Let's share up to that boundary. And then if we need to go past that boundary, let's go find a way to do that. And I say the same thing to my industry partners, say the same thing to academia. And in this case, um, the electromagnetic spectrum research really around phenomenology of understanding that domain. I talked about it a little bit earlier, about how we can now understand and better characterize and then utilize from a vulnerability as well as an operational uh, context. And we do that simultaneously with our warfighter because in EMS, EMW, and cyber, the TRL level, the technology readiness level, goes from a low one, two, to a nine almost overnight because you don't need to shake, rattle, and roll this stuff. And so you need to make sure that what we're working on, um, and we're in partnership with, uh, with NSA, NRO, you can get whatever three-letter identifier you want to bring out um, to make sure that we're providing the capabilities that are not just filling a gap, right, but are giving us that, that, that disruptive technological advantage. Um, it, I, I did not give you specifics because I'm not going to. Um, but I'm here to tell you that the investments in science and technology in this area is relevant, producing uh, uh, eye-watering results, uh, and is going to provide our warfighter the capabilities they need. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. We had a question, this lady up here. And, uh... Thanks. Hi, I'm Winner. Shelley Stone from VA Systems. Hi, Great Shelley. to Good see you again. Good to see you again. Um, so, question for you about demos. If we go back to slide eight, I noticed on there. A lot of the priorities that are outlined, there was only one, and perhaps it was just a, a font trick, but at the top there, there was only one in a white box that said expanded at sea demonstration. I'm curious just about kind of within the budgetary confines, some of the challenges that you've encountered, obviously given the small cross-section of S&T as part of the rdt and &E budget, where that, that tension is between actually once you get the technology ready and being able to plan for that, that, that platform demonstration. Yeah, that's a great question. So. Understanding 616263 uh, dollars and the definitions for those uh, is important. Experimentation and demonstration is the lexicon we use for the S&T 63 world. And then prototyping and demonstration um, uh, for our 64, let's, let's see what else we can do. It's, it's, it's really a blurred area, and it should be a blurred area, right? Um, because we're not really sure uh, if this technology is going to be uh, effective in a particular domain or be a technology that's useful to a warfighter, right? Those are the two elements that you're really trying to get out of the experimentation and demonstration. When we start a project now, um, we do a, a DNA thread all the way to a program record. Um, that's my past life coming to bear on the S&T community. And we look at that and we say, how would this technology, if it comes to maturity, actually provide technical risk reduction for some capability? And when would we need to know to affect that? And so we lay that in from a schedule-driven perspective and say, we need a demonstration of this technology and a first order cut from our warfighter on, on operational feasibility and applicability. Um, I, I, I'm building this clock because we back that up and then we say, okay, where are the experimentations and demonstrations? All of those have experimentation. That's a representative. That's not everything. That's a representative. We have the little carrots, right? You know, it can't be PowerPoint. This is a Microsoft project, if that really 
gets anybody happy. But this is not just PowerPoint engineering and, and science. So we sit down, and the one I'll use is Locus, low cost unmanned swarming technology. Next week, down in the Gulf of Mexico, we will be flying, we will be launching 30 UAVs within two minutes. And they will be forming up and they will be flying, they'll be engaged. That demonstration, right, has been uh, stair step five, 10, 10, 10, 30. Um, and we've, we've put that together, not haphazardly, we put that together, we've had some puts and takes. That's all six, two, six, three dollars. At the end of this demonstration, um, we've already had the conversation with our um, resource sponsors and the appropriate other stakeholders in the Navy on what's the next step. And we're not having it after, we've had it before, so that we can keep this moving forward. So that's one example of how we need to do that internally, and then we have to keep our industry partner in tide because there's cost share opportunities, right? It, it might look like, well, I don't, you know, cost share opportunities to keep moving this forward, and not just with the OEM that's part of this, uh, a part of the system. That's the part that bends some people's mind. I, I sit back and I go, well, wait a minute. I've got Lidos working unmanned surface vehicles. I've got this company working. Let's get this together because I want to be domain agnostic in the next demonstration. I want a UUV, USV, and UAV swarming together. Uh, we want to understand, is that technically feasible? The answer to that is yes. How do we bring that together? I've got three program managers that go, I've got to work with him. Right? It's, it's, there's, a lot of this is not the science, it's the business of the science. Um, and so each of those uh, projects that we have have inch stones for experimentation and demonstrations. Um, and understanding how we bring that together takes day-to-day -day program management uh, and leadership in the technological domain. Thanks, Sean. Yes, yeah, spread it around. How about that gentleman way in the back there with the white shirt? Uh, Admiral, thank you for coming. Um, my name is Tom Risen. I'm a reporter at U.S. News. Uh, I'm wondering about if what you can tell us about the latest in directed energy and lasers. Uh, uh, a couple of years ago, ONR released some really cool video of uh, laser shooting down, melting a boat and shooting some drones. And I was wondering if uh, you can tell us what the latest is. Um, uh, how big is the field of study? Do you, you know, are other countries or uh, some major companies that you're working with on this? Uh, just give us, give us the latest that you can tell us. Sure, Tom. Uh, first of all, uh, we still uh, continue to have our shoulder full in into directed energy. Uh, so you know Richardson's um, uh, strategic uh, focus to ensure that we can rapidly deliver next generation capabilities to our warfighter um, has directed energy um, uh, in that list. Um, our uh, technological maturity um, has uh, continues to move forward, but we've moved into an engineering prototyping domain, right? Um, the current 30 kilowatt uh, capability that's out on the Ponce, uh, for example, continues to be operational, operationally effective. Um, have we shot down adversarial things? No, uh, but we're ready. Um, and the fact of the matter is, is that deterrence is as good as sometimes the actual use. Uh, understanding how we operate that continuously feeds our, our sailors and our warfighters on concept of operations for our next step, which is our solid state laser technology maturation s and project. Um, and that may or may not be up there. Uh, my eyes aren't as good as yours. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that is on track. Um, and we are working uh, specifically with the Northrop Grumman Corporation uh, as the lead with a uh, portfolio of se second tier suppliers measured in about 20 to 30 uh, businesses. And the majority of those are small businesses. And looking at, what are we looking at? We're looking at energy density, energy storage, and the ability to extract energy quickly. We're looking at high um, uh, resolution and next generation optics so that we can combine these lasers. Right now, the Ponce brings six uh, energy sources together um, and then shoots it out. What we want to do is combine that energy together and then bring it through. You get a much higher or lower um, degradation and power loss and a higher um, uh, energy irradiance on the uh, target. Irradiance is just the power level of the size spot and the time on there. Um, one of the things we're doing uh, from a uh, understanding what's good enough, right? Uh, for all those bombardiers out there, you know, we drop uh, uh, Mark 82s. We go to a thing called a Joint uh, Munitions Effectiveness Manual, JMEMS, uh, to determine how many do I need for this type of target, right? 
there is no JMEMS manual for laser energy, right? I say, how long does it take to cook a two minute egg? Well, it depends, right? If you turn up the heat, it's less than two. If you turn down the heat, it's more than two. Well, what does it take to engage different target sets? It depends because we're talking about a very dynamic environment, um, especially in the maritime domain. We operate in the maritime domain and that is a very unforgiving and very um, non-deterministic uh, environment to be using uh, laser energy. So we're doing that science, that exploration, that experimentation, and that's pretty exciting to tell you the truth because we're really defining and understanding things we never knew before. Um, we're also um, uh, moving forward with uh, prototyping um, uh, laser elements uh, that we plan to put at some of our warfare centers uh, to be able to do more experimentation and demonstration um, and then uh, get those, uh, those same types of capabilities out on uh, our aircraft carriers, our destroyers, uh, and our other ships uh, as soon as possible. So that's where we are right now. It's, it's full bore, we're moving forward. Uh, we've got good academic and um, industry uh, participation. Uh, and we're off and running to the next generation of ultra short pulse lasers. Uh, some of the stuff that, you know, if you think Star Warsian, um, uh, shields and things of that nature, that we're working on that um, in, the, uh, in the laboratories. Uh, that's, that's, that's years away, but we gotta be working on that as well as the, um, uh, the mature TRL level seven stuff that we have on the pond set. Thanks. Okay, I think we have, we'll have one more question. Uh, how about this gentleman over here on the right side in the blue shirt? Everybody's wearing a blue shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Admiral Mark Selinger, Defense Daily. Uh, besides the, um, the swarming demo that's going on next week, you mentioned another one in September. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? And when do you expect to get to that three domain type of uh, swarming demo? Yeah, so um, the, uh, the, the locust demo that's next week, um, I really, I think I've said all the details of that. Um, uh, the next steps on that is, so now what? Just because you can swarm a bunch of UAVs, that's cool, and, you can, and they don't run into each other, and you can break them off and separate and then re recombine them. Uh, and so we have our Warfare Development Center um, uh, tied to our hip on all of those, um, and uh, doing tabletop, storyboard, uh, as well as technology innovation game type of activity. Um, so Locus will provide um, our, our warfighter the opportunity to see how that fits into their game plans and then we'll continue to support as this transitions um, to a warfare center and potential programs of record. Um, from a uh, surface we did a um, one on the James River 2014-ish um, um, and that was the original algorithm set that now has been matured as in Locus. Um, we have a follow-on to uh, to that which is more operationally uh, aligned uh, for a high value unit with uh, multiple swarming boats to set up a, t a perimeter, break off, engage an adversary, come back, um, and all man on the loop um, and, uh, and approved by the Coast Guard. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of you know, preparation that you have to go to, to go do that. So that's going to be an exciting uh, demonstration uh, towards the end of September. Um, the uh, uh, LDUUV, our LDUV program continues to move forward. We'll have a demonstration uh, early next year um, that uh, takes um, uh, one of our vehicles uh, from San Diego to San Francisco um, in the water, under the water, um, uh, in an open ocean navigation, sense and avoid demonstration. Uh, I emphasize that because, ladies and gentlemen, sense and avoid for an unmanned vehicle, it doesn't matter if it's in the air, on the surface, or on the ground is not insignificant, and it's not trivial. Um, our unmanned surface vehicle just passed the collision regulations for our surface warfare folks, uh, coal regs. Um, so it can operate man on the loop, but it just goes, and, and if there's un, um, unscripted actors, can maneuver, stop, and it does it all itself. It understands, it senses the environment. That algorithm uh, set, we're using the UUV, we're using that in UAVs, um, to understand how you can maneuver. A little more challenging under, under sea, um, but we understand um, the topography well enough 
Um, but we're demonstrating, still experimentation, still experimentation, very important to understand that. Um, and then uh, when, we, when will we bring LG, UUV, USV, and UAVs together? Um, that's not on a chart, right? That's not, um, we need to make sure we've uh, continued to mature those domains and get that out to prototyping, say for example, in the next rim pack, uh, two years from now, uh, fleet exercises, um, uh, we're actually going to be uh, a part of uh, the United Kingdom's Joint Warrior um, 2016 here in September. Uh, they have uh, First Sea Lord uh, chartered an unmanned warrior element. We're bringing 10 U.S. Department of Navy technologies to demonstrate. Um, I bring that up because we need to be leveraging off of exercises where we can. Um, right now at RIMPAC we have uh, roughly 40 uh, experiments uh, being uh, executed and, and um, across the board in RIMPAC. Uh, one of the most uh, fascinating is a, a nomad, and I'd be happy to talk to you about afterwards, uh, but a rotary unmanned system that can uh, fly station keeping on a moving vessel, um, and depending on what kind of payload you provide um, on that uh, rotary uh, nomad, um, uh, you could actually provide uh, increased uh, self-protection in the electromagnetic spectrum, for example. So a lot of experiments ongoing right now, um, all the time. Um, so to try to uh, list all of them is uh, almost uh, as, as cumbersome as that, but it's important to understand, and, I, and I, I relate this to senior leadership, that we have a mechanism so we do know what's going on. And you can have confidence that we're executing the science and technology experimentation and demonstration um, that's most relevant and tied to our N81 MAAs and our fleet um, uh, capability gaps. Thank you very much. Admiral, uh, on behalf of CSIS and the U.S. Naval Institute, we thank you for coming out today and taking the time. You have a hugely important portfolio, and uh, I think we got some great insight here today about your your vision for all this, and we, we appreciate it. Uh, also, CSIS and the Naval Institute want to thank our sponsors, Lockheed Martin and Huntington Ingalls, who have made uh, this Maritime Security Dialogue series possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Adam. Thank you. We really appreciate it. Thanks.